<laughs> Hello, beautiful people. Welcome back to That Conversation, a podcast where we have the hard conversations that help us grow. <sighs> How are you doing? I hope that you're doing good. I hope that you're feeling restored, um, excited, um, and ready to have this hard conversation. I am actually really, really, really excited to have this conversation. This is a hard conversation for sure, but it's a conversation that I've been wanting to have for like almost three years now, like almost over three years actually. For years on my YouTube channel, so this this podcast, I started this like last year, right? Around May 2022. Before I was saying having the hard conversations that help us grow, before it was, you know, I never come to be right, I come to start the conversation. Um, and I still believe in that. That's still my thing. I'm never really here to be right. If you notice, I'm never really here to tell you what's right and what's wrong. It's just really about my experience um, and what I learned in my experience and what helped me and then giving you the tools that I've learned that helped me so that if you wanted to do the work in your own life, you could. And I used to say, you know, I used to hate my blackness. I used to hate my queerness. I used to hate my body, right? And I've always been really honest about that. And the thing is, on my channel, I had conversations about hating my body and hating my queerness. Like, I've talked to psychiatrists. I've had different, like, people come on my channel to talk about their body experiences. And we've talked about, like, that a lot. Um, but if you notice, I never really got into the conversations of, like, hating my blackness and what that looked like and what that sounded like. And so in this episode, in spirit of Black History Month, <laughs> um, and just in spirit of like growth and where I am in my life, I'm really excited to share because it can help a lot of people. But in this episode, I want to talk about how I identified that I didn't love my blackness to the fullest. And even for the people that aren't black that are here, this is also a conversation just about finding things that you hate about yourself and how that hate can harm other people. Um, because it is easier to cause pain than it is to feel it. I want to talk about what that looked like and how I uncovered and identified my own self-hatred, what that anti-blackness looked like within, within me and how it affected other people on the outside, including dark-skinned people and like colorism and just all the parts that play into that. Um, and I just want to have a really honest and open and transparent conversation about it because that's what I do. Like, you know... When you listen to the voices of the world and voices outside of spirit and you, you know, you, you start losing direction. And I think that's what happened with me. I think that I've always been very clear about what my content is about. Anybody that really follows me and knows me and watches me knows that Tariq gonna be honest. He gonna be open. He gonna share some stuff. They're like, oof, I'm surprised you shared that. Like even in my head and depression episode when I was saying I was on Jacked and Grinder and all these apps just looking for someone to validate me because I felt so small. Like I'm just, I've always done that. Um, and sometimes um, that's, I've always seen that as my superpower because I do it to help. Um, but sometimes, you know, other people don't understand you or your mission or like why God puts you on this earth. And they sometimes can make you feel bad about that. And I think um, I got a little out of myself and I cared too much about what other people thought about what God needed me to be doing in this world. And so I never really, you know, we're going to talk about it, but I never really, um, I don't know, I just, got, I just got removed from purpose. And I'm excited because I've done the work to know um, my purpose again and who I am. And so I'm just, I'm just really excited to talk about it because I just know it's going to help a lot of people. If you are listening to this podcast on a streaming app, I am going to be using pictures and like just different things on the visuals. So if you go to my YouTube at Tariq Ali, um, you will be able to see like just different pictures and things to go with the story. Um, as I tell you, um, but yeah, we can get straight right into it. So if you're not new to the podcast, then, you know, I start off with a story. And that story kind of helps us get into the lesson or what I learned. Um, you know, I'm a storyteller. I'm a screenwriter. So, you know, that's how we do these things. <laughs> um, but this, this one starts off with a story with my two best friends. If you've watched me or followed me for years, then you have seen Ronald and Aleem on my YouTube channel. Ronald and Aleem um, and Ja'Kyra has been on my channel too. Those they, They've been my best friends since high school. Um, 
And so I was on the phone with Ronald and Aline. This was around the time that I was starting to do like a lot of deep talks on my channel, you know, like uh, talking about racism, talking about, you know, trans people in the military and how they deserve to be in the military and talking to my dad coming out, talking about mental health. You know, I called my mom who left me when I was little, just having a lot of deep healing type conversations. And I didn't know that they were healing. I really just, I knew these were things that like were shame for people didn't like to talk about. And I just wanted to share like my outlook on it. And then that's when I kind of got into like, oh, wow, I'm helping people. And so, yeah. Um, but this was around that time. And I'm telling you that because with all that going on, I just started to think more. I just started to be more inquisitive about everything. Um, and I remember talking to my best friends on the phone, Ronald and Aleem, and I told them, I said, hey, I want to tell y'all something, but I'm afraid of being judged. Can y'all please like not judge me? Um, like I'm embarrassed. And I, I just, I just want to talk to someone about it because... I, I'm not sure what it means. And they were like, okay, what is it about? <laughs> um, and I was like, you know, these are my best friends. So I just thought, you know, I just thought this was a safe space. And I thought that this could be a space where I could just be honest and boom. So I said, well, um, to be honest, I like my skin more during the fall and winter. And they said, okay. <laughs> and I was like, well, because like I, I used to suffer from like a, a lot of hyperpigmentation. This was before I really discovered sunscreen, wear sunscreen um, um, and retinols. But I just, this was before like I really got into skincare and I was just talking about how in the summer, you know, my skin gets darker and I get all these like pimples and like I like get white, like bleachy spots on my face. Like, I don't know, my face, the hyperpigmentation was just really bad. Um, and I just noticed that my face would go through all of this stuff during the summer. And I was trying to pretty much ask them, I was like, you know, because I'm intelligent, <laughs> you know, I'm intelligent. I was like, it's, it bothered me. Um, I knew something was wrong that like when my skin got darker, I didn't like that. And that I liked how like my skin was like vibrant and lighter in the winter and the fall, because like, you know, I'm, I'm like, I, my skin color changes like I've been so many different hues and colors and I've been like really light then I've been like really dark it just it just changes you know um and so I was just being honest about like because it changes so much I was just talking about the ones that I usually like more and I knew there was something wrong with this I did and so that's why I was asking them um because one they both were dark skin and they're my best friends and I, they would I knew they would be honest with me um and I got two different responses <laughs> And if you really follow me and if you watch my channel and like seen me, Aleem and Ronald in a video together, you won't be surprised by this. But I got two different responses. Aleem was very like, wow, that was really honest of you. And he kind of like respected my honesty um, and was saying like, you know, that dude, you know, he was still being real. He was like, you know, that don't seem a little boom, boom, boom. Um, but he just was more. I think he was just more proud that I was able to even just accept that and be honest about it. While Ronald, on the other hand, he was like, I don't really know how you expect me to feel. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, like, what do you expect me to say? Tariq, I'm fat, I'm big, I'm black. Like, and you're telling me you want me to sympathize with you because you're like, you're light skin, Tariq. To him, like, you're light skin. And you want me to sympathize with you because you like your skin when it's lighter and not darker and you're telling me as a dark skinned person. And I just felt so ashamed. <laughs> I just felt so ashamed. And you know, the initial reaction, I understood what he was saying, but I just felt so like, because it took so much out of me to be that honest and to come here and to, you know, inquire and to try, I'm like, I'm trying, like, help me, you know? I just, I just know in that moment, um, I saw the two different reactions of what I could get from my vulnerability and honesty. And at the time, this was before my healing and therapy. And so I was in a mindset where I could just, I wanted to hang on all the love that I could. Any, you know, being juggled around homes and homeless and not having my parents there, like 
My fear of, of abandonment was too large. So that's why in these years, I was like, I, you know, I, I realized I triggered Ronald and I understood that. And so I just like stopped telling him and I just kind of like started doing the work on, on my own end because his reaction showed me that there's something wrong with this. And so I just kind of like went and just started doing my own work and doing it on my own and not sharing. And so that was one of the reasons I just never shared it online. I was like with the body stuff, like people relate and with queerness, you know, people get it. Boom, boom, boom. But with the race thing and the color and the, it just, I was too afraid to lose. Hmm. I was too afraid to be honest and in that, honesty and vulnerability lose love and I saw that my best friend my best friend even like it, it caused like a rift in our relationship for a couple of months like we didn't talk and I just saw that and that was fear my mind told me yeah don't talk about that <laughs> don't talk about that and you know maybe talk about it when you're done Talk about it when you're on the other side. Talk about it when, you know, you've like, this is the old me, you know, um, because that's safe, you know. And, but the thing is, because I'm so connected to God and I've always listened to what was inside of me, God told me that I was supposed to come and start conversations, have the hard conversations. I've been doing it for years. Um, God gave me all of this the audience, who I am, my uh, gift for gab, all like my talent for speaking, my writing, all of this. So that when he told me I needed to talk about something, I went out there and I did it. He said, I gave you this audience for this. So you need to go out there and talk about it. And because of my fear of losing and my fear of hurting and my, and I just saw my best friend alone, I was like, well, what would that do to my audience? Like, I just, I'm afraid um, and I was uncomfortable, but the thing is now I'm at a place to understand one God, look, when you look, when you are living in a dream that God gave you, you're going to keep doing your part. One, God needed me to talk about it. So that's why he made the cancellation happen later. We're going to talk about that. But also I have, now I have the understanding that it's not supposed to be comfortable Tariq, and And for several reasons, one, Growth is usually never comfortable. When you're trying to change yourself and, and become a better person and get rid of, of these old habits that you realize are not healthy for you or helping you, that's not easy. It's uncomfortable. Um, and not only that, um, healing, I know when we talk about healing, we think it's all about you know healing the things that people have done to us, but it's also about healing the things that we've done to other people. And the harm that we cause to other people. It doesn't have to be malicious. Like, don't think, you know, I never hit nobody or I never, you know, stole somebody money. Like, it's not even that. You don't realize it's, we, like I said, it's easier to cause pain than to feel it. And so when you're not feeling your pain, I'm more than sure you're, you're causing it to someone else. Whether it's being defensive or lashing out or being rude. Like, and for me, we're going to get to it, but it was my own self-hatred was contributing to the colorism and, 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 and the anti-blackness in the so society. Um, and so that's the second reason of why this won't be uncomfortable. It's like the things that we want to change, like racism, colorism, misogyny, homophobia, all these things and social issues that we want to change, they cannot happen without conversations. And when you think about, like, this is the best way to always think about it, because when you think about the greatest oppressor or whatever, <laughs> it's like white people, <laughs> you know, and like, you know, and like white people. And when you think about white people, when it comes to talking about race, police brutality, black people or anything, you know, they feel uncomfortable during these conversations. And so they avoid them. And if we let people just stay comfortable, nothing will get changed, nothing will get done. And so I had to realize that I was on the other side of privilege and oppression with this, Tariq. You are lighter. You are light. Like, I don't, <laughs> look, I'm a different color to everybody. I'm light skinned. I'm just going to say, I don't, look, it's like, you're, you're on the other side of this. So it's not going to be comfortable for you. It shouldn't be comfortable for you. And in order for it to change, being on the other side, it's up to me and us and anyone. It's up to the other side 
to have those conversations. Like if it just becomes the oppressed always calling it out, calling it out, calling it out, nothing really changes. The conversations need to be happening over there, really. And, and, and so that's another side of like, this isn't going to be comfortable for you, Tariq. And I had to just like under, accept that one and understand that, you know, because when we talk about positivity and growth and healing, it's always like me, 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 me. What people hurt me, people hurt me. But you got to also think about what you're doing. And so that, that was, that um, is why I'm so happy and excited to come here and to co- have this conversation. And not just today, I want to continue having this conversation because it is uncomfortable and it's going to be hard. And like, yes, I'm going to, I'm going to share so much in this podcast episode and I want to get to a place where more people can be honest. And if you're not like, look, I'm a public figure. God put me here to do this to the world, but you don't need to you scream it to the world. I guess like, it's just, we have to be honest first to really get to the work and to get to the healing. Um, let me get back on track, girl. But yes. So like I said, um, after, you know, I realized Ronald's reaction, I realized, I just saw that moment as an example of what would happen if I talked about it on my channel. So I just never did. You know, I said, I hate my blackness, but never got into it. And God needed me to talk about it. Um, and when he needs you to do something, if, you, if he'll tell you, he'll send it to your head. But if you don't do it, he's going to find a way. And what he did is he did find a way because that's when <laughs> that's when um, I got canceled three years ago. The way it happened, it's a really, I made like this. The funny thing is it was a Latino boy and he wasn't Afro Latino. It was just a Latino boy and this other white boy. They were like stands. And I think they thought I was they got upset with me. I don't know. It was on Twitter. Um, and they were like, oh, we're going to get you out of here. And so I was like, OK. And so I just went to sleep and then I woke up to like all of these tweets <laughs> um, from when I was like, like, like just 10 years ago. I got on Twitter when I was in sixth grade, I think. Um, yeah, but I got on Twitter um, and by the time this happened, I had 110,000 tweets. That gives you an idea of how much I was tweeting. So yeah, it was like a random day. Oh no, it wasn't a random day. This was actually my last week of college. I was moving to LA, starting my YouTube career like full time. You know, I majored in biology. I said, I'm not going to med school or dental school. I'm going to go to LA and live out my dreams. And the night before, so spiritual, the night before, um, this is when um, those boys on Twitter, those people on Twitter, like went on Twitter and found my old tweets from when I was like in middle school. And I remember just waking up from like a call, I think at like one or 2 a.m. Somebody called me, I can't remember who. Um, it was like, are you seeing this? And I went online and I'm just seeing all these tweets, all these tweets from when I was in middle school, like when I was a freshman, like it, it was crazy. And I wanna read some of them because I just, because for the context of this episode, I just want you to hear how dark they were, how dark, um, and just I just I want you to hear it <laughs> um trigger warning um for one dark skinned women that have experienced a lot of colorism or just people talking down to them and also trigger warning for sexual assault um and the r word I don't usually like saying that word I always say the r word on this channel on this podcast but I I want to I just want to really read them um just so you can see how dark they were um yeah so one of them was one thing I hate about dark black women is they always loud and smell rank. If I did date females back, if I did date females, black bitches would be the last thing. And the other ones um, were like, oh, I want to rape one of my followers. And I'm ready to rape, bully, and intimidate the new freshman next year. And oh my gosh, Drake should rape me and Trey Song should rape me. Oof, that just aged horribly. But just like all of these just disgusting, like, just disgusting tweets. Like, they're just really, really disgusting. And so when I first saw these tweets, I mean, I was shocked. I was like, I said that? I mean, I was so shocked. My friends were even like, Tariq, did you say that? I was like, I don't, I don't think so. I said that? Just like looking at them now, like if I was a parent and I, and I saw my child's Twitter and they were saying all these things, I would be alarmed. One, because the person you probably would have met at that time in real life would not have matched the person 
that was tweeting all those things. It really just seemed like a cry for what, like help or attention. And honestly, like thinking about that time, it really was because at that time I was obese. I was homeless. I was being juggled around homes. I was being bullied for being queer, feminine. Like I was not happy in life. And I really became a barb and a big Nikki fan and like on having a life online because I didn't really like my life in real life. Like I, I, that's what I really resonated with, with like Nikki, like she did the whole accents and stuff to like escape her world. And so I kind of got online and just like got obsessed with like, wow, I can be a whole different person and just like say all these crazy things and it just won't matter. Like, you know, like <laughs> it, it was just like an opportunity for me to escape everything I was going through. Um, and so at the time I knew like in the context of like Twitter, this was before Twitter was even an app. This was like back when you would text 40404 to, te to tweet, like you had to text to tweet um, or you had to get on a desktop. Like there was no app. Um, and, you know, I didn't have anyone to talk to in person. And so I just got online and just talked a lot. And the only way that you would get attention online at this time, it wasn't a lot of people on Twitter, was if you said crazy shit. And this is really when trolling happened. It was like, you just say crazy shit to just like get reactions or responses like, oh my gosh, this celebrity responded to me. Or like, that's, you know, that's what trolling is. It's like, it's just a bunch of kids that just really <laughs> want attention. Um, and so with that knowing, I initially, you know, was like, well, I know that's not me. You know, like I, I understood the context, um, but still I was just so upset that I hurt so many people. Like it was, just, I was just upset because I could see that it hurt a lot of people. Um, and so I didn't really care to like give an, I didn't really care to give an explanation. Um, I just really cared to give context. So what I did is I recorded an apology video and it was a three minute video and I described one, I just started saying sorry and apologizing and saying, you know, yes, I was a child, but I'm just sorry that I ever contributed to the hate that went towards black women. And I just talked about how like black women are always like they like they are always the ones that get the most hate. Um, even in the black community, like they are the most oppressed. Like the jokes just always go to them and especially dark skinned women. And so I just was like, apologizing that I ever was a part of that. And even though I knew that wasn't who I was at the time, I was like, the fact that I was even just ever a part of that, I'm ashamed. So in the apology video, I really just spoke to like, one, my anti-blackness and my self-hatred. And I talked about how, like I said on my channel, I used to hate my blackness and this is just the proof. Like, like I, I think I was also just so shocked because I was just so honest about it. Um, and like, how are y'all like mad at me? Because I was honest about it, but it, it reminded me of the thing with Ronald just because you're being honest doesn't mean you'll be accepted or it'll be comfortable. And so I just kind of backed down and I apologized and I gave background for, you know, the colorism remarks and the ones towards, you know, the dark skinned black woman, but also for the rape um, tweets. I, I, I didn't have to, but I felt like the only way that people would really understand, because when I thought about it, like I had never shared, I had never shared at this point that I had been, sexually assaulted, R word, by my older stepbrother for years in my childhood. And in that apology video, I talked about how I never healed about that. And I think that's why I was making so many jokes. Um, and so, yeah, that's what happened in that apology video, right? But the reason I'm sharing all of this was because I still, in that moment, like I apologized, but I didn't want to come and have the conversation then because I didn't want to seem like I was explaining myself or trying to excuse myself. So instead of like trying to have the conversation, I just apologized, took accountability and I went away. And I just, I, w I thought it was important for me to go away just because I just needed, like, you gotta give, you gotta give people space, man. You know, when you piss somebody off and like, you just keep trying to talk to them, like, girl, just, uh, you know? And I felt like, especially black women, like I, I felt like they really just needed like, Girl, I can love you and I can understand, girl, but that that's a lot. Like in in you know, for the girls that really rocked with me, it was just it was a lot. And I was really ashamed, so I just like went away. And God still was like, You're not getting it, are you? You're not getting it. Because I need you to talk about this, Tariq. I put you through this because I knew I would teach you how to learn from it so that you could go out and help more people do it. That's why you're here. 
I'm getting emotional. That's why you're here. And, but God had grace because baby, that, that, that moment, that cancellation did so much for me at the time. I use, like I said, I started on social media, going to social media for an identity, for a voice. And so when I started doing YouTube and like talking about things and I felt like I had a voice, I was like, oh my gosh, I matter. I have a voice. People like me. And so when this happened, I was crushed. I felt like my voice was taken away from me and everything I had ever did did not matter. And I thought that I was a horrible person. Everything, everyone was calling me. All the things I was seeing, I was just like, wow, I'm a really horrible person. Like, I stopped making content. I stopped doing a lot of things. This, I went into a great depression. I was having panic attacks. This is when I met my ex, the toxic relationship I'm always talking to y'all about. I, I always say I was, in a, I was in a bad place. I was depressed. And that's how he got in. He met me when, in this month. <laughs> I, w- I didn't like myself anymore. I hated myself. <laughs> I don't want to cry. Like, I'm not trying to, I I just, I'm thinking about what other people will think. Don't do that. Be yourself. I hated myself because I just didn't understand. I just didn't understand how I could have ever said those things and and been a part of this. Um, And so I just got in a really dark place, but it was because, it was because I got in that dark place that I, I was like, I need to be in therapy. And I got in therapy And that is what started my journey to get me here, to know that I'm a healer, to know so much about mental health, to know so much about, like, this Tariq you know now is a different Tariq back in the day. Like, yeah, I used to start the conversation, but I was young. You know, I was was still smart and talking, but... It's different now, baby. There's some science and psychology that I'm talking about here. Like, it's, it's different. And it, it wasn't until I got to that really dark place that I was able to heal. I was actually starting to feel all of the things I went through in my life. Um, and just so much. It just, it just started, it just catapulted me into this place of healing. But if it's something that I learned in therapy, um, it's that... Feelings and words inside of you don't just go away. They don't go anywhere. Like if if you have it inside of you and you think if I just don't talk about it, if I don't just if I don't give it attention or, you know, if time just passes, it'll go away. But they don't go anywhere, babe. They stay there. (laughs) They stay there. And even though I was telling myself that they were just jokes, you know, I said this was when I was a child and I was just doing this for attention. I also understood that Behind every joke is a little truth for the person that's saying it. Because if, if you didn't think it was true, it wouldn't be funny. Like, if you've known me to pass every single test in a class that we're in together, right? You wouldn't make a joke about me failing the next test because that wouldn't be funny. Because there's no truth to me failing tests. Like, it just wouldn't be funny, you know? And so the only way that I would have thought that joke would be funny or that it could even be a plausible joke, even if it's not funny. Like the, even the fact that I thought that it was a joke meant that there was some truth in there. Not truth in the world, but truth in me. There was something in me that believed that dark-skinned woman or just being dark. I do, it, it really, that, that tweet is really just about being dark. Um, I'm gay, so it came out in that way, but it really is about being dark um, and about dark-skinned people in general. And it was something in me that thought that that was less than, right? And so with that understanding, it made me fall into an even greater depression because I, when I tell you I love my blackness, (laughs) I was raised in Southern Virginia, Portsmouth, Virginia Beach, Chesapeake, and, you know, my granddad was a part of it in, in the sit-ins, like, you know, where they would go to a restaurant that was for all whites and just sit and they would put mustard on them. Like I was raised very, just very black and to, to love my blackness. Um, and so this put me in a very deep depression because I, I started going through an identity crisis because I was like, but I love my blackness. Like, you know, I've, I've marched. I've, I've, you know, I, I've had so many conversations on my channel about being black. I've had more dark-skinned black women on my channel than any other woman. I was just, I was so confused. 
Um, and I didn't really know who I was anymore. And because of that, because the truth is, I just accepted the truths. Like I was like, yeah, I love my blackness, but also I'm seeing that I don't like my blackness as, you know, as much as I can. Like I'm seeing that like there's some colorism in, in me and th those didn't agree with each other. And so I just didn't know who I was anymore. I kind of accepted that I didn't know who I was. So I just looked to what other people were telling me. This is why in my relationship, I started to just like mold into what he needed me to be. And, and like what he said I was, if he said I was this, I agreed to it. And, you know, if he said I was manipulating him, I was manipulating him. And this is why I was looking online and every, all the hate I was seeing, I accepted it. I was like, well, maybe they're right. That's who I am. I just was having an identity crisis and, and that made me even more depressed. And that's actually around the time that I went to Vermont. Um, and if you saw the Vermont series on my channel, um, I went there with like 20 something other black artists and we were there for a month and we lived on a farm. Um, and I just was trying to find myself again. It was so random. And it was because of that. Like my friend saw how depressed I was. Um, it was like, you should come with me, you know? And all those black people on that farm, man, they just poured into me. I was really honest about everything. And they, they just poured into me and said, Tariq, like, I've only known you like what, a week? And that's not who you are. And I remember we did this exercise and it's like you put the mirror in front of you and um, someone from the camp, like everybody that was there, somebody would come and give you affirmations and you had to receive them. And it's about, you know, black people need to get their flowers where they're while they're alive. And it's about, you know, affirming other people. And so I remember Kyra went and she told, wow, she started off with, you do not hate black women. Ah, uh, I don't want to cry. This is, this is ugly. Um, but no, I just remember her telling me that and just pouring into me for an entire month and telling me, Tariq, even if that was who you were, you can always decide who you are today. And I can tell that hasn't been you for a long time. E like, and... You know, I left Vermont so full, but I knew, I knew that there was still something inside of me that needed to be worked on, you know, and this was not something that positive thinking could fix. This is not something that the friends around you can pour into you and fix. This was something, look, I, I'm really big on growth, y'all. Like, I don't just be saying this for fun like I I literally see my flaws or things that like I could work on and I'm like I really want to work on that and like I said I love my blackness and so when it presented to me that I didn't like it as much as I thought I was like oh well what are we gonna do <laughs> what are we gonna do we gotta fix this um and so I went I came home and I asked God I said you know God I think you know I think I I've done the work but if there are still some more that I need to do show me Show me because I want to do more. I want to love my blackness to the fullest, baby. I, and, and I want to love it to the fullest. And I, I asked God. And so it's so God, he, he will talk because a couple months later, I had this campaign with a company and I was waiting for it to bleach my hair because I wanted my hair to be fresh. This was back when I was platinum blonde and I've bleached my hair at this point for years. Like I was known for my platinum hair, right? And I have never bleached my hair and messed up. And for the first time, I bleached my hair and I think I was just focused on something else. And my hair fell out. All of my hair fell out. Not all of it, but I had patches. I'm going to put pictures. <laughs> um, and I remember canceling so much the campaign. I didn't leave the house. Like, I just canceled so much because... Like, yeah, I had bald spots, but even when my hair grew back a little bit and it just looked like I had it shaved down and it was just my natural hair, I didn't want to do anything. And, you know, I would tell myself, well, you know, my brand is the platinum hair. My brand is the platinum hair. So, you know, I don't want to take pictures and I don't want to like post because they're going to think that this is the new hair. And, you know, I also like don't want to wear hats like my hair is my thing. That's what I was telling myself. But when I thought about it, I said, Tariq. You won't even leave. You don't even want to leave the house. You don't want to take this hat off. You don't even like what you see in the mirror. 
And this is how your hair grows out of your head. And I was so confused. The thing is, when I first started YouTube, I was doing like Bantu knots and, you know, natural hair care and all these things. And when I started doing my platinum hair, I started realizing how much more attention I got um, and how much more love I got. And people called out my hair. They loved my hair. And I think I looked more racially ambiguous. And I knew that. I knew that because when I bleached my hair, my texture changed. You know, like it's a little bit thinner. You can make more waves. It's like more curlier. And people thought I was mixed. But I will always turn it down. I'm like, no, I'm not mixed. I'm black. But like I knew, being honest, I knew I liked that like exotic feel people liked of me. And I think seeing how much more attention it got me, I started to really attach to it. And I noticed that when my hair fell out and I didn't even want to leave the house or take off my hat, I said, Tariq, you don't love your hair the way it comes out your head. That's, that's your blackness, baby. That's your blackness, like in the genotype and <laughs> the phenotype. And when we talk about blackness, like, yeah, we love the music. We love the dances. We love the food. We love the way we talk. Everybody love AAVE, but do you love the way that your hair comes out of your head? Do you love the way that your skin looks in every season, not just in the winter when it's lighter, but in the summer when you get the darkest you can? It was these things that I started to, I just, I just started to put everything on the table and every single one of them, I could give you a reason why. Well, I want my blonde hair because, you know, that's my brand. Oh, and I like my skin more in the winter because, you know, I just have less pimples and boom, boom, boom. And, you know, I even used to wear color contacts. Well, I just like them because they just like, you know, they look cool. Like, boom, boom, boom. Like, it's like we can come up with all these different reasons. But when I put it all on the table, I said, oh, okay. This is alarming. Because outwardly. And in my life, I was very pro-black. I loved myself. I loved my blackness. But I started to see how I wasn't loving myself and my blackness completely. And I said, oh, no, we got to do something about this. So I, I, I stopped going blonde. And I haven't been blonde since. <laughs> so I've never really told that story. And I've, I've, I, I... One, I'm going to do an episode after this about like what specifically I did to learn how to love my blackness more and like all these different realms. But it's just like I stopped going blonde because I was like, Tariq, I don't want to move forward. I want to love my blackness. I don't want to move forward if I can't love my hair the way it comes out of my head and to know that I'm just as beautiful as when I have my platinum. That's not better. I'm just as gorgeous, if not more naturally. And I, I wanted to believe that. And I just tell myself that. I wanted to believe that. And I told myself I would never go blonde again until I believe it. And the crazy thing is, I started believing it. And then I didn't want to go back blonde. I didn't want to wear those contacts. You see, because when you really get to the question of when you ask yourself, why? Why? And, you know, you get that first response. Oh, no, I just like the way. No, no, no. Why? Why do you like it that way? Oh, well, I just need my hair done. Like, you know, my hair just not done. You know, boom, boom. Okay, cool. But you look great. Oh, you need to slick down that baby edges. Well, why? Like, that's just her hair. It's moisturized. You want it slicked down so it can look thinner? And like, it's just like asking these questions of why. And there's no judgment in right or wrong here. You notice that I'm not saying that other people, look, I'm saying, I looked at myself and said, I would rather this. And so I want to work on that. I'm never here to tell you, you right and wrong and you should do this. And this is how you become a better person. That's not the goal here. The goal for me is to always to just get you thinking, to think about your own life and your own decisions and, and, and those type of things. I'm never here to tell you what's right and what's best because I did it. It's better. No, this is what worked with me. You see, this started in middle school. Um, well, it just started way, it could have started way before, like, you know, but it's like I'm saying that the whole tweets. For my journey, I saw like, oh, wow, that's how I was thinking back then. And then also my hair falling out. It was like I had a lot. This was what was on my table. 
You got to look at what's on your table and make decisions about what you want to do with that. And I saw what was on my table and I didn't like it. And I'm going to give you some more. What else was on my table? I, look, I remember Ronald. See, Ronald, I live for Ronald, girl. Y'all going to live for Ronald. Y'all always live for Ronald. Ronald told me years ago, we were talking about dating and like just like what we're into. And it bothered me that they always said that I was into light skins. Like all my friends, like, oh, you're into light skin boys. I was like, no, I'm not. Like I'm into all. And Ronald would be like, okay. And I'm like, can we talk about this? <laughs> like, you know, because like in my head, I'm really like, I love all. And Ronald was like, I'm gonna just be honest with you, Tariq. I think that you think like all of them are attractive, but I think that when you are looking for something serious, it's just light skin. Like I feel like darker dudes are just like, you know, you just, you, they never go anywhere long lasting. Like I never have seen it being a long term thing with you. And he's like, I'm not saying that you just use them for sex, but it's just like, just looking at patterns and you know I have to be honest and I just accept it and sometimes sometimes we know ourselves too well and what I say is what I mean by that is we have an idea of who we are and we always defend that but sometimes you gotta and look at your table and when I even put that on the table from when I used to wear contacts to my hair falling out and me you know and then now the dudes I dated, I looked at all my exes. I said, wow, all my exes have been light skinned. Wow. I've never had like a, a dark skinned boyfriend. I mean, I haven't had that many boyfriends, but like just anything long term. Um, and I, I just, you know, sometimes you got to like remove what you know about yourself and just look at the facts. Look at your behavior. As a screenwriter, when we write stories, um, when I was learning how to screenwrite, there's this thing about characters, characterization where that when you're creating a character, when you give a character beliefs, those beliefs drive their action. If a person believes that it's vain and conceited and arrogant to give themselves compliments, then by knowing that's what that character is, it wouldn't make sense in a scene for them to like be in the mirror and be like, wow, you're so beautiful, boom, boom, boom. It just wouldn't be believable. That's why when you watch some TV shows and you're like, she wouldn't do that. Like that doesn't even make any sense. It's because it starts with beliefs because beliefs drive action. When you look at a character and you see what they believe in, that's how you know how they would react and what they would do in a situation in a scene. And so that's the same with us. Our beliefs drive action. And sometimes you got to pull back from what you think you know about yourself and look at, look at your actions and your behaviors and look at what's on your table and say, hmm, my beliefs, like I know it's different up here in my head, but looking at this table, if I was to just look at this table, here are some of the beliefs. And, and I had to be honest at one, I wasn't loving my blackness to the fullest. I thought that, you know, lighter skin was better. And that could it'd be multiple, you know, before getting to the judgment, you just got to accept. You just got to accept. What is your table telling you? And I was just looking at my table and I'm like, okay, I don't love my blackness and I have some kind of color issue here. I have a color issue and I'm not loving my blackness to the fullest. And so instead of going to see everybody on the outside and especially like online from the cancellation, like judge, 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 judge. And that's okay. Like whatever. Like, but for me, you got to silence the world. If you really want to grow and you really want to heal and you want to get to the next level, you got to silence the rest and look at what's on your table. And you got to make a choice about what you want for yourself. And I looked at my table and I didn't like it. And so I said, it's time to do some work. And as we get older, we start to have a better understanding of our image and our perception to others, what people think about us. You know, it's just because we have more experience in time and years and we go through a lot of friends and we see what people say and don't say about us. We're just like, OK, this is what I am in the world. Um, and so what happens is we get a great s sense of self and how we look to other people in our perception and due to fear of losing connection or being liked or whatever, you try to protect that image and, and keep that image what you want it to be. So what we do is instead of sharing things that we think would change our perception to others or make people not like us, we keep it to ourselves. And when we keep it to ourselves, 
we think if we just don't act on it consciously and if we don't talk about it, it'll just go away, right? But like I said before, all those words and beliefs inside of you, they don't go anywhere. Either you're going to work on them or they're going to come out. Like they got to, something has to, they're still there. And because those words don't go anywhere, they may not be in your conscious anymore. They fall down to your subconscious and then they go to your unconscious and then they show in your behavior because it's still what you believe. It's still inside of you. You didn't work on it. It's still there. So it becomes an unconscious bias. And if you've ever heard of unconscious bias, unconscious bias is pretty much things you think without thinking it. And so this is how I was able to see the difference between like, no, this is who I am, but also looking at what was on my table because I was able to see my unconscious bias, the behavior that was coming from my, my unconscious bias, and then also the difference in the contrast between who I was saying I was. And I had to accept that maybe I didn't know myself that well, or maybe them, there are some things that I need to work on. And so unconscious bias can come out in a lot of different ways. Like you may not be walking around thinking women are less than, or, you know, saying that women are dumb or like being outwardly misogynistic. Right. But if it came down to it and you were a CEO and it was between a man and a woman for a job, you're thinking, oh, you know, he, he will be able to get it done. He won't be emotional. She may, you know, she may get pregnant. What if she fall in love? She start getting distracted. It's like that contributes to misogyny, even though you're not out here and, you know, you help women, you donate to women, you're nice to women, but it still presents itself in your behavior through your beliefs from your unconscious bias. Or, you know, you, you're white and you, you know, you think police brutality is horrible and, you know, you speak up about racism and, you know, all these things. But when you get on a train, you feel more comfortable sitting beside a white person than the black person over there, because what if he like you know, tries to take my purse or boom, boom, boom. And that is unconscious bias. It's like things you're thinking without thinking. Like you don't get on the train and think that you just instinctually want to sit next to the white person because you'll feel safer. But it's about looking that be looking at that behavior and asking why, why do I feel more comfortable beside this white person? You know, and, and for me, Looking at my table and saying, okay, I don't like my hair, the way it comes out of my head. Okay, all my boyfriends have been light-skinned. Oh, ooh, the color contacts. Ooh, these, the, the, these tweets I was saying in middle school. I was like, oh, but this isn't, this isn't who I know myself to be, but my behavior. There's some beliefs in here that needs to be worked on. And so that is how I uncovered and started looking at the anti-blackness and the colorism within me like and and that it, it it shows you how how we view ourselves ultimately is how we go out into the world because this had nothing what did like it hurt this is what i'm saying because i didn't like my own blackness enough that like for if i got darker i didn't like my my blackness as much my hair i didn't like my blackness as much because i had that own self-hatred and i didn't love myself enough that belief showed in my actions and harmed other people that were dark skinned and contributes to colorism. It's just how that boss contributes to misogyny, even if he, you know, you don't go out here and say crazy things about women and the person on the train that contributes to profiling. It, it, it's and, and that's the accountability. It's just really it's, it's very nuanced and it's very hard um, and that's why I kind of wanted to, that's why I really wanted to come here and to talk about it because it's hard because you'll know yourself to be one way, but you got to really look at your behavior and start asking questions. And even with the assault and rape tweets, like, come on with this, we're talking about, I thought that was funny because I had never dealt with mine <laughs> and everything I had been, I went through in my childhood the, with my brother, R, word, R wording me all of my child like years of my childhood it was never talked about ever talked about in my family after my apology video came out my granddad called me the next day crying hmm. and said I'm sorry and if you actually watch 
my coming out video with my dad, there's a moment in the video where he says, I'm sorry I wasn't there to protect you. And the camera starts zooming in and I'm looking into space. And that's when I started crying. And I think people thought he was talking about my queerness, but he was talking about that. And that was the first time I had ever got like an apology for that. And, but it still wasn't spoken about. It was kind of like a, you know, I'm sorry, you know. And I, w I received it, but it was just, that's why I was so lost. I was so looking aimlessly in the, in the air. Like I was just like, wow. And so that's why like if we don't work on these things and, and look at what's inside of us, they don't go anywhere, baby. They don't go anywhere. And it's because I have the terminology and I've read so much and learned so much that I am able to even do this work. I mean, come on, we're talking about unconscious bias and looking at what's on the table and asking yourself questions. Like, it's because I've done the work that I'm able to have the terminology to speak about this. I'm so passionate about it and I've spent so much time on it in my own life to heal and to become a better person because I'm so passionate about it. And God gave me that passion because he knew I would come and want to share it. And that's why I made this, this, this episode because I want to get people thinking, especially like, you know, Black History Month, just in general, whenever month it's going to be like, start looking at some of the things in your life and asking yourself why. Look at your behavior. Look at your actions. Why did I do that? Start asking yourself why more and, and separate yourself from who you know yourself to be. You're always changing. Every day we change. We become a different person. We're, if you're really in the business of growing, you got to always be asking yourself who you are, looking at your actions, looking at your behaviors, looking at your fears. These things are what show you and tell you who you are. And it was because I was able to be honest with myself and say, hey, I don't like my blackness to its fullest. And there's some hints of colorism within me. Like I don't, I like my skin when it's lighter and it's starting to hurt other people and like it's affecting other people. And the thing is when you share this with other people, there will be judgment. And you, you there will be judgment and there may not be, but you got to understand that. You got to silence those voices and you got to do the work for you. Don't do it for other people. Don't do it for redemption. That's why like with this podcast episode, I, I'm not doing this for redemption. I'm doing this to help. I want to help somebody, man. Like, I, I love my blackness to another level now that I'm going to love my kids so much. Hmm. I am going to love my kids so much because I really love my blackness. I like really, and I'm, it's always a journey. I remember watching Brene Brown and she was talking about racism and she was like, white people are always like, you know, I'm not racist and I'm racist. It's not about if you're racist or not. We're all racist. It's just about how much. It's all about how much because we are a product. When you understand psychology, we are a product of our environment. Racism is systematic. It's institutionalized. It's everywhere. It's the way that we know the world works. So it's in our brain that this is the way things work. So if it was to be a change, you would be like uncomfortable. That's how that even contributes to racism. So it's like not about if you are or not. It's about how much do you have and what can I do to work on this? And so that, that I think is the big word for me. I think that in this time, especially on social media, there's so much like, Who's problematic? You're a colorist. You're a colorist. You're a racist. You're a racist. You're this. You're misogynistic. Oh, not you hate. Boom. Whoa. Like if we're all perfect, then where are these things coming from? You know, it's not like the four or five people we cancel a week these days. Like it's, it's not like these. This is things that take millions of people to, to happen. I mean, like it, it, it's, it's like if we're all perfect. Who is the people that new, needs to do work? Our brains are neurologically hardwired to keep us safe. So if I see that other people are being torn apart, like uh, losing everything, uh, being called every word in the book, losing friends, losing so much, and they have something that I may relate to, I'm just going to do a better job at hiding it. That's just white people. 
You think a lot of them stop saying the N-word? No, they just stop saying it in public. <laughs> and this is not faulting the people calling it out. This is because with that ideology, it would be faulting like everyone that goes out and marches, people that speak up about racism. It isn't about that. Well, I'm calling this out because I want to talk to the people that because your brain is trying to keep you safe, you see how that wasn't safe for someone else. So you, you, what happens is those beliefs and those unconscious biases go deeper inside of you. And it's even harder to see because your brain is going to hide it more so you can stay safe. But I want to challenge you to, in your own space maybe, start looking at your behavior and asking yourself these questions. That's when you'll really find peace. And that's when your brain won't have to be overthinking and doing all this work. And you won't be as anxious because you won't be putting so much energy into staying safe. Because at some point you'll be able to just be you and not have to worry about that. And the only way that there will be any type of change and any, all of these oppressions is that if the people on the side of the oppressor or the oppressing or the people on the other side of privilege, even if you're not oppressing, just whatever, the people on the side of privilege, you got to start asking yourself questions about your beliefs and doing the work to change those beliefs so we can see change in the world. Because I, I hear people keep saying, like, is this ever going to end? Is colorism ever going to end? Is racism ever going to end? Is misogyny? It's like, call, like calling it out lets us know it's still present. But the people on the other side, y'all, we need to know. Like, I'm saying we because I was a part of it at some point and I did my work. But it's like you have to just in your own whatever, whatever time, whatever space, you got to just look at your beliefs and look at your behavior and see what you can change. And so, yeah, um, I'm so happy that you guys came to have this conversation with me. I wanted to come and offer it um, because I can't come here and to tell y'all to have, be vulnerable and to heal and, you know, all these things. And I'm not doing that in my own life. Like, yeah, I shared a lot of other things, but this is something that's been like a stone in my belly. And I'm so excited that I was able to finally cough it out. Um, and I love you guys. And I hope that you have a great day. And yeah, I don't really have much more to say. I'm just really stunned that I just did this. Wow. Three years in the making. Wow. Wow.